we find that e Ethiopia is a modern um, uh, repeat in a sense of old Israel. It, 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 it's like in the modern in the modern times in the modern way, Ethiopia is similar to biblical Israel, and what's even happening right now after the um, the apparent um, overturning of the monarchy or the suspension or this interregnum, this between rulers where there's not a visible king of kings upon the throne of David, that from that article, the article that I had mentioned um, just previously, which is known as practicing, it's on the Tigra, on, Tigray online um, website, and it's called practicing, practicing hypocrisy in the EOTC would be very detrimental to the cohesion of the laity. And what the, what the, the fool doesn't recognize and of course, people say, well, the Bible says don't call your brother fool. Well, that's why I say the fool don't recognize this, because a fool is not my brother, and that seems to be the will of our father, period. And still, they are opposing the king of kings and his Christ, and this particular individual is Dilla Wenberunega, and it was November 8, 2010, that this particular article that we found on the Tigray online website and what first caught our attention is we were doing a search, and some of the key words had, had, had come together. And um, then we had went into the article and found it to be very interesting because what we learned is that it's an undeniable fact, as the writer says, up until 1974, that we all, that, that all of the the... Christian, Orthodox, Ethiopians, they all um, responded amen or amen when, now they add this part in there, they say a holy synod sanctioned prayer that called for, quote, God to place under the crushing feet of Haile Selassie, of Kadamawi Haile Selassie, all his enemies. Then now the individual now is playing the hypocrite. They're saying that, well, up until 1974, we were saying amen. And in fact, if this individual is being correct, for all the kings, especially the, the, the righteous and anointed kings upon the throne of David, remember, the throne of David is called the throne of Jehovah. So the very same throne of David is also the throne of God or the throne of Yahweh. And the Bible verifies this. But then the individual says, what a fallacy. And as we pointed out, they misspelled fallacy. So they're trying to make a slick statement but should have used spell check or should have understood that fallacy has, has two L's and not one L. And, you know, we, we call the L is, I know nowadays people say this is loser, but it's really a right angle. You could say it's really Masonic. So it shows that they're not really squaring reality. But then the individual goes on to ask some um, where in the Bible or EOTC canon law does it state that opposing Haile Selassie, Kedamawi Haile Selassie, that is, is opposing God? So our response to that is biblical, is scriptural. If, if Ethiopians, some careless Ethiopians want to know, and if they do want to know, they have a right to know, where is that written in the Bible? We go to Exodus 2.2. Exodus chapter 22. And Exodus chapter 22 is Torah, is the Orit, and it's called the sub, subsection, the Judgments. It's under a subsection called the Judgments, and it first begins with the right of property up until verse 15. Then from verse 16 to the end, it addresses the law, continue to address the Orit or Torah or the Hug, the law, the judgments, and the crimes against humanity. Now, this is according to the Schofield Study Bible, and we see here the crimes against humanity is the subscription that's written right there, and this is the study Bible that we, that we utilize. Now, when we get to verse 28, it says, Thou shalt not revile the gods. Thou shalt not revile the gods, or the Elohim, nor curse the ruler 
of thy people. So you're supposed to bless the ruler of thy people. But here's what I mean when I say that that Ethiopia in a in 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 a very ironic way is a reminiscence it's, 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 a, it's a repeating it's a reflection I think the word is reflection I'm trying to get a reflection of old Israel even in the north-south division between the northern between Etara and, and the Tigra and the Tigray the northerners the so-called Tigray and the Amhara the Amhara and the Oromo the more central and the southern and then when we look at old Israel, we have after David, after great King David, and Haile Selassie is, is, an, is a David Solomonic, but a more a Davidic, a Davidic type, according to the prophecy and according to the fulfillment. It's the same sort of north and south division. You know when in the New Testament there's a woman at the well and Christ, he ministers to this woman, this woman at the well. And she says, like, um, you being a Jew, you are asking me as a Samaritan. And you, you have to understand the background of that. And a lot of Christians don't understand the background of the woman at the well incident. Because the woman at the well was a Samaritan. They had a certain practice of worship of God in the north. But... Jesus, Yeshua, our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos, he was a Jew or coming from the south or Judea. Now, Judea and, and northern Israel or Samaria in the latter times, but the earlier times after Solomon's passing, that's when Israel broke. That's when, that's, that's when Israel was divided between the, the northern ten tribes. But then even in David's time, when David already was the rightful king, it would take another seven years later for the ten tribes to acknowledge that surely Yahweh hath chosen David, DVD, that he has chosen David. So we see this split between north and south that is very interesting and is similar to um, the whole sociology and, and, and from a political science perspective of of, of civil war. We even look into old um, Egypt. We see this north-south division. So when we look at Ethiopia and the current crisis in Ethiopia, this ongoing, actually, crisis in Ethiopia, we see the same north-south division, whether you look at it from a Tigra versus, uh, you know, a Tigrayan versus Amharan, or uh, Amharan and even Ormo to some, to some extent, um, because some Oromos are part of that Amhara. Some Oromos are seeking to be separate from that because they're seeing now this division, you understand, this division between the Tigra, the Etara, Eritrea, and the current political situation in Ethiopia. It's like Jeroboam. You remember Jeroboam? You had Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon, Jero Jeroboam. You understand? He was another one who was more acclaimed in the north and how it was all divided, how Israel became divided and the, the ten tribes separated for all intents and purposes, even down to religious rites and rituals from the southern Judea. But the real key difference, and this is what a lot of folks keep missing, the real key difference between the two was the monarchy, the monarchy of David and the Davidic covenant. You see, Judea or the south, the southern tribes, always remained faithful to the Davidic covenant. You understand? They, they were faithful to that Davidic covenant. In other words, they accepted, acknowledged that Davidic covenant. But the northern ten tribes did not. The, the, the southern Judea or Judah also was the place where Jerusalem was and the worship center.
what we learn later on on the Rehoboam and other northern kings of Israel. This is what you hear in the Bible. If you read in the history, you find it's a king of the, uh, he was a king of Israel, or this one was a king of Judea, king of Israel. So later on, Yahweh will say that, say that um, Israel and Judah was like two wives, and he divorced Israel, the northern ten tribes first, thinking that Judea would straighten up, straighten up her act, and as they say, fly right. But she didn't learn from that, so he also divorced Judea or Judah as well. But what ones don't recognize is that Yahweh was married because of the Ark of the Covenant and the, and the other interactions and exchanges to Holy Ethiopia, to Ethiopia as well. So now when we look at that background and start to carefully study what's going on today, we are seeing um, a lot of biblical, scriptural, prophetic similarities but now when this individual here, Dilwenberu Nega, admits that in their prayers up until 1974, they all responded, amen. Nobody twisted their arm, nobody threatened them with death or anything like that. But they all responded, amen, to the prayer that called for God to crush, un to, to place under the crushing feet of Haile Selassie, all his enemies. Then this double-minded, careless Ethiopians were going to try to call it a fallacy, and then ask the question of where in the Bible or the EOTC canon law does it state that opposing Haile Selassie is opposing God? Let me ask you this. To oppose King David, right? To oppose King David, would that be to oppose God? To touch King David, would that be to touch God, to touch God's anointing? Does God regard that as touching the apple of his own eye? He does. So recognize your own hypocrisy. But if you want a biblical verse, and we just gave it to you, we're just looking right here in the, um, in the Jewish Chumash, where it says, Thou shalt not revile God, nor curse the ruler of thy people. Now, it has God here, but then it has a, a footnote. It says, Thou shalt not revile God. This is the law prohibiting blasphemy and cursing judges, where the judges are called Elohim, who were appointed from the priesthood. Scripture, these are all different um, Jewish uh, um, rabbis and other commentators. Scripture taking into consideration what usually happens, mention judges, since they are liable to be reviled by the discontented party in a lawsuit or trial involving capital punishment. Do not criticize the judge even when you consider him guilty of a deliberate perversion of justice, is how another commentator views it. But the simple and direct basically is that the ruler of the people is regarded as God on earth, the ruler of the people, especially the rightful anointed ruler of the people. So far, I have yet to really hear of any wrongdoing or any sin or crime that His Majesty has done. I mean, I hear a lot of ones talking that they, don't, they didn't like decisions made, but they have yet to implicate His Imperial Majesty in any offense for their intense hatred. But here's where you got to. Here's where you got to. Y'all said amen to a prayer to the Almighty God that God placed on the crushing feet of Haile Selassie all his enemies. And even though y'all think y'all may have gotten rid of his majesty, look, Rastafari, both among Ethiopians abroad as well as Ethiopians at home, even among the Gentiles, is a continually budding and growing reality. So you cannot win. The best thing you can do, careless Ethiopians, is repent before Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 12, comes to greet you, comes to meet and greet you. So the last part here in the footnote says, nor curse a ruler because such action is harmful to the welfare of the community. Did you, did you hear that? 
curse not a ruler, nor curse a ruler, a ruler of thy people. Why? Because such action is harmful to the welfare of the community. Think about it for a moment. I mean, think about it seriously. Why do you think the famine that occurred in Ethiopia were in the provinces, the two provinces that it happened in? If you study those two provinces and their relationship to his imperial majesty, for the most part, there were many haters against his majesty and violators in those two provinces of Tigray and Wolo from the very beginning. Now, whether Tigray and Wolo has a great culture, so forth and so on, yes, it does. But that has nothing to do with the careless generation because the careless generation, unfortunately, were the inheritors of something greater than they themselves. And therefore, when you inherit something that you're not worthy of, you inevitably lose it. And so the EOTC and Abuna Paolos and his posse and others who hate Rastafari and who hate his imperial majesty, y'all are on the losing side of prophecy, of revelation, of reality. And while time remains, consider and consider carefully and consider wisely. Because when you curse the ruler of your people, that action is harmful to the welfare of the community. So I would dare say that some of the greatest curses of his imperial majesty came from the Wolo and the Tigray provinces when his majesty asked them, who causes famine? Is it God or is it man? Because they were blaming him for the famine. So you're saying that he did it? So he asked the he acts as, became like an okalish, like when Christ asked the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees the question too, and they said, we cannot answer it. It's not that they could not answer. They were already condemned already, just as they were condemned when his blameless majesty asked them, who causes famine? Is it God or is it man? They cause their own famine on themselves. Yes. And they embarrassed the king of kings, but they caused their own famine. His majesty was more honorable. His majesty took the fall. He, he acknowledged, he acknowledged um, culpability as, as the first servant of state, you understand, to show you the path of honor, not of dishonor, of righteousness, not of unrighteousness. The prohibition, this prohibition applies alike to the political and spiritual leader, to the political and spiritual leader. You know, it's like foolish people who will curse the ruler in the land that they're in and they expect to be blessed. You know, it's one thing if you're in a, a physical act of armed struggle against somebody, you know, and, and that's different. But you're going to be trying to go about all peacefully, do your own business, make your own money, and you're cursing the ruler of your people. You know what I'm saying? You can criticize certain things, but y'all are curses and haters of his imperial majesty. And this is why um, Zechariah, Zechariah, or is it, no, it's Zephaniah, Zephaniah. Zechariah has other particular information. Let's go there and remind you. And we give thanks for the Hebrew Israelites who have kept this verse front and center. Although some may not fully understand its full significance, Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 12. Ye Ethiopians also, ye shall be slain by my sword. The sword of yod heh of Yahweh, or egiziyad heh malet what is the sword of God? Is it not the word? Is it not the word of God? So it's the word of God that is judging you. And it's the word of God that will become as that sword for you. So please, while there is time, you know, um, redeem the time. The days are, the days are evil. You know, and before it's too late. Accept the truth of the good news of the King of Kings and His Christ. I mean, this is a serious proposition. We're not, we don't get nothing personally. We're not doing this for selfish personal gain, Yovas. But since we learned that the true God is not willing that any should perish, 
And personally, some of us could say, you could go to hell, really, if we were to judge personally. But we are seeking to um, not be conformed to the world, but transformed by renewing of our minds. This is why we, in, in great discipline, put out this message with as much love and compassion as possible to really try to reach at least some of y'all, if not most or all of y'all. So please note this. Now, we were still speaking about Yeshua, Jesus Christos, and the woman at the well, and the division between the north and the south. Remember what she said? She was like, um, you're, you're a Jew, and I'm a, and I'm a Samaritan. You know what I mean? Why are you asking me for, for water? And it's right, I mean, it's all of chapter, chapter 4, Jesus and the Samaritan woman. So what we can look at this, Jesus, the southerner from Judea, and the Samaritan woman from, from, from northern Israel or Samaria, Samaria. We can also look at this in the sense of Haile Selassie, Ketamari Haile Selassie, southerner, and you haters of his imperial majesty, northerners, in the very same way. But check out one of the wise. Some of your women are wiser than y'all. This woman, the Samaritan woman, it says, Now Yaakov, Jacob's well, was there. And Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So Jesus, our black Lord and Savior, he was weary. He was tired with the journey. And he sat on a well, and there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Yesu saith to her, give me to drink. I just smile because some would say, hey, don't you say please, you know, that, that, that confusion, that, that worldliness right now that people think. But he just said, give me, give me the drink. For his disciples were going away to the city to buy meat or to buy food, meal, not flesh and debtors, but to buy food. Then saith the woman of Samaria to him, how is it that thou being a Jew, you are a southerner. You know, it's like, it's like in Ethiopia today, if the same sort of scenario happens, and uh, from one Tigra or Etere, woman would say to um, Hara or Rastafari, how is this that you being an Amhara, or you being a Jew, a southerner, ask if drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria, question. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Oh, ye Ethiopians. Is this where you're, you're trying to push Ethiopia to divide Ethiopia like this? You understand? Between the Tigra and the Amhara, so forth and so on, and the, and the Oromos and both of y'all. Is this where you're trying to divide it? Notice what Yeshua said. Yeshua answered and said to her, If thou knewest the gift of Elohim, of God, of Egeziah, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living, living water. The woman saith to him, Sir, she said, Sir, or Adoni, uh, Adoni, but here translation says, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? If you, you know, I'm, I'm picturing this like, like it's part of a film or a passion play. You need to get some woman who can be like that neck shaker, you know, that neck shaker. Because when you read and study and get the spirit of what she's saying, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? You know, it's a little bit of like a mockery. You're talking about this living water. Like, is this your game or something like that? You're trying to throw a game at me? Art thou greater than our father Yaakov and our father Jacob, which gave us, us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Are you greater than him? Yeshua answered and said to her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. 
Now he's going to reveal to her the indwelling spirit, which is the true teaching of the Tawahido or the uh, Rit'it Amin or the Ritua Hymenot. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him shall be in him. So this is an esoteric reality, not an exoteric, not an outer, but it's an inner sense. It's an inner reality. Because he's saying that, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well. So that water that I give you is going to become a well of water springing up into Eternal life or everlasting life or iska zilalamawi hiwat malet. The woman saith to him, Sir Adoni, Adoni, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Now, when I, when I look at it, some people would say she was convinced already. I say she's becoming convinced. I would say that her character, if properly understood, her character was still not taunting him, but still, you have to remember that there, there is some sexual, there is some sexual um, tension here, mostly on the woman's part, not on Yeshua's part, but Yeshua's parable now, he, she, she's saying to him, um, give me this water, because remember, she's going, she's probably doing this for a family, like in Africa and other parts of the world, a woman do a lot of this kind of work or well far or way far to a well to draw water or to a stream or somewhere like that and have to carry this water long distance over and so on. So she's probably saying this just so I won't have to do this 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 difficult um you know, or tedious sort of work. Now Yeshua said to her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Yeshua says unto her or to her Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. It's your boyfriend. Almost remind me like Joe Brown. You know, you're shacking up, you know. You've had five husbands, and the one you have right now, he's not your husband. You're just like shacking up with a man. And that saidest thou truly. And that you've spoken the truth. Now, now you're beginning to become a little bit truthful. Now the woman saith to him, Sir Adoni, Adoni, the faithful woman used Adoni or Gita or Gitaye. Adoni, I perceive that thou art a prophet. I perceive that you are a prophet. She's coming around gra ever so gradually. Our fathers, she goes on to say, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. No, 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 hold up for a moment. Where did Yeshua say this? Go over the text in St. John's Wengel in his gospel, chapter 4, and we're at verse 19, or really verse 20, you could talk. Where did Yeshua say that? I mean, I'm looking through this. I read from the very beginning of their encounter, and I don't see where he said that in Jerusalem. Maybe she's saying because you're a Jew. You're a Judean. You understand? Know you're, you're a Ihud, a Ihudawi. You're a Yehudawi. You understand? Know you're a Yud. You're from the Yah's hood. You're from Yah's hood. You know, you're from the hood. And y'all say this. So how is this? Now, Yeshua, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, in In other words, in other words, admit, you know, accept this as tr truth. Don't don't be dally pally. Don't don't doubt this. But but have confidence. Trust me. In other words, like trust me. The hour cometh when ye y'all, all of y'all, shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. So both of the holy places, the holy places in the north. And then the holy places in the south are going to be forsaken. So in neither place will they worship, notice, the Father. She is speaking about the fathers. He is speaking about the Father, singular versus plural. You understand? Or the real Baal or husbandman 
versus the Bel'am or the husband men. He goes on to say, ye worship, ye know not what. You worship what you don't know. You worshiping, you don't know what you're worshiping. We, he's saying we, and now he is defending the Yehudawi, the Ayhud perspective vis-a-vis -vis the Samaritan forms of um, worship. He says that we know what we worship. I and I know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. Salvation is of Yehuda. Salvation is of Judah. Salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. Elohim is a spirit. Yahweh is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now the woman, she said to him, I know that Messiah cometh. That Messiah is, that the Messiah, the Moshiach, is coming, or the Mashiach is coming, which is called Christos. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Yeshua said to her, I that speak to thee am. I that speak to thee am, or I am who speak to thee. I am the I am, in other words, that is speaking to you. Just as what happened with Moshe or, or Moses with the burning bush, where it says, Ehya shara ehya, and, and I am who I am. So he's using the divine I am, not just I am, you know, Ani Anoki, you know, words, that Ani Anoki um, from the, the old Hebraic, which is contracted, or contracted becomes the Ani or Inne, even Bamarinya, the Inne, with the hidden Yod, in connected with the Nehas or the Ne, the end sound, but that's a little bit uh, grammatical and, and uh, linguistic there. And upon this came his disciples. Now his disciples came along, and they had wondered, you know, how is this that he is speaking to this particular Samaritan woman, which goes further to show that there was a difference between the north and the south. Even though this is one so-called people, Israel and the Israelites and the Hebrews and the so-called Jews. See, when you say Jews, it's only proper in the sense of southern, the southern tribes. And the southern tribes held to the Davidic monarchy. That's the key right there. That's the key to even solving this this Ethiopia political and social and spirit, it's really a spiritual crisis. It's really a truthful crisis, a truth and an honesty crisis. Because all we have to do is admit the truth. And a lot of this pain and frustration and division would go, would go away, would basically be gone. 